we kick off with the first of our um, webinar series and we're really lucky um, in that we have a guest speaker joining us today. Um, I'd like to introduce Pamela Streeter. Pam is the Head of Learning here at Te Papa. And so she's a very experienced curriculum designer. Before she came to Te Papa Tongarewa, she had 16 years experience at the Ministry of Education, where she worked at the system level to be able to create the conditions for meaningful and engaged lifelong learning so that every student in New Zealand has the best opportunity to achieve. The focus of her work has been guiding and challenging the conversations around the future of learning, transformational learning opportunities, and the role of digital technologies in learning and life. I can't stress enough how fortunate our sector is to have someone of Pam's capability here working with us, um, and also the fact that she's going to be involved in the background of this project throughout our time, but she is um, our first, I guess, keynote speaker for our webinar series. Welcome, Pam. Thank you. I'm blushing. It's very nice to have lovely things said about me. Um, I've met many of you, um, and some of you I haven't met yet, um, but I do hope that through the course of the next um, period of time where we've got kind of a high level of engagement together, that we can get to meet and know each other a little bit better. Um, I don't know if there's anyone from Otago Museum here, but it was back in the day before my ministry days that um, I started my journey into education in the museum and culture and heritage sector. Um, and I worked there for a, for a period of time just after studying at university. So kia ora to those guys if you're there who um, helped me begin this pathway. Oh, kia ora. Thanks, Pam. And Nathan, I just saw your message pop up. Yes, we are recording the session today, so we will be putting it up on our website um, sometime within the next week. Today's session is going to be a very much a conversation. We're going to draw out as much of Pam's knowledge as, as we can in this uh, hour and a bit that we've got with Pam, um, really focusing in on the New Zealand education system. So, oh, and just before we actually start with the questions, we will have opportunity throughout. So if you'd like to post your questions in the chat, feel free, we'll come back to them as we go forward. But equally at the end of today's session, there'll be an opportunity for you all to take the mic and ask Pam directly um, any of your questions. Pam, as we start out, can you provide an overview of the New Zealand education system from a system level? Sure. Um, it's quite a big question. And, and I think um, just before I start, I think I'll be really clear that I'm going to focus on the teaching and learning aspects at a system level. Um, there's quite a lot of complexity in any education system, and New Zealand's one is no different. Um, but if we focus on teaching and learning, that's the place where um, my work has focused and where this capability fund is kind of prioritising its focus in terms of our ability to support our learners. Um, and also, I, like I also recognise that there'll be plenty of people in the audience today who know a lot of this stuff. And so I'm sorry if I'm telling you um, stuff you already know, but I'm going to assume that there's a wide variety of knowledge and background, and it's always good to kind of go back to first principles. So. Um, uh, the stuff that you know, um, uh, just keep listening and we'll keep talking. And if you've got anything that you like to challenge me on, I really welcome that as well. Um, so New Zealand system is, um, is really unique for a couple of different reasons. There's two big main reasons why our system is quite unique. The first one is that um, it, uh, it operates on a basis that schools are entirely self-governing. Um, so they're, they're governed by independent boards and they make all their own decisions and the same goes for teaching and learning. They, schools themselves decide what the teaching and learning looks like for their, youth, their young people in their community and we're going to keep coming back to that quite a bit today because um, there's a bit of talk about um, school-based curriculum and local curriculum and what all that is about. Um, the other part of the system that's really unique um, is that it is a system really of two halves. So um, New Zealand was the first country in the world actually to have developed an entirely um, unique indigenous curriculum. Um, and so while we have quite a small number by percentage of our learners learning in the other half of the system, it does represent entirely half of the system and has to be supported with that in mind. So um, in terms of energy and design and development, we're putting half of that effort into designing for learners that learn in the medium of Rao Māori. Um, 
at the same sort of um, energy input as we do for the, for the English medium sector. Um, and the third thing that's a bit unique to New Zealand, um, although not entirely um, in the world, is that because we've got, an, um, we've got an independent schools that govern themselves, um, the government provides its guidance um, in a very high level way. Um, so that guidance is provided and framed by a national curriculum. And you'll probably be very familiar with at least one, if not all of these. Now let's just see if the camera can cope. Can you see them? Can't really see no, I can't really see them. Oh, I can stop the background if that helps. Maybe we need to stop the background so you can see. Yeah. So the national curriculum is made up of three documents. This is Tafariki. I'll just wait for that background to disappear so you can see it. Well, I love the technology. There you go. So Tafariki. Tafariki is uh, the curriculum that governs our early childhood sector. And this is a, I want to say it's a bilingual document. It's not entirely a bilingual document because the, it's not a translation. The two halves are different. So there is half, um, the front, this, this half is for um, the early childhood sector that teaches in the medium of English, and it is framed in a particular way. And if you flip the book, this half is, was designed by the ministry in conjunction with the Kohanga Reo National Trust, and that's the half that governs teaching and learning in early childhood um, in the medium of Reo Māori. Um, early childhood sectors are free to engage with whichever part or a mixture of both as they see fit. Um, have a look at that, it's available online if you'd like to look at it. The other part of the national curriculum supports the compulsory sector. And so we've got the New Zealand curriculum, which governs English medium teaching and learning, and Te Marautanga Al Aotearoa that governs Māori medium teaching and learning. So the thing that's unique about both of all three of these documents is that they're not syllabuses. They are guidelines only. And if you think just about English medium, all teaching and learning for the entire compulsory sector is encompassed in this very small document, which is, I don't know, 100 and something pages. Um, so this doesn't dictate what and how learners are taught. It only gives an overview of what the government's expectation of the outcome of learning of education system looks like. Similarly for the marau. Now, if you haven't, I um, encourage you to pull these down off the internet and have a good look at them, or you can order them up from the ministry if you want a hard copy, they're available for everyone to have. To be able to have a look at how they are similar and how they're different, it's important to know these two documents are very uniquely different. There are some real similarities in terms of learning areas and those sorts of constructs that we're familiar with, but they are framed very differently. So it's not the situation that you can design something, um, a unit of work that adheres to the New Zealand curriculum and then simply translate it and try and deliver it in Māori medium for Māori medium schools because they're different documents and they do different things. I'm just going to stop there and say Monica is very kindly putting the links into all of these into the chat um, and we'll also make sure that the links are posted up with the webinar recording as well. So if you're wanting to engage deeper in any of the documents or any of the things Pam's talking about, the links will be coming through. Um, so the other thing, so I've just made a few little notes to make sure I don't miss anything. And the other thing that I've got on my list of notes is um, that is unique about New Zealand's education system are where there are issues with it. So every education system has its issues and New Zealand is no different. We're considered internationally to be a very high performing system, but we are also noted internationally as having one major issue in that data, and that is the size of the what they call the tail of underachievement. So there's a large proportion of, relatively large proportion of kids that are systemically underachieving in our system, and those kids are more likely to be Māori or Pacific. And the thing to note about that is that those learners um, when you look at a similar suite of learners that sit in the Māori medium education system, their performance is very good and comparable to um, other learners at quite a high level of performance. 
And so those kids that sit and unfortunately sit in that tail are being underserved by the, the system that they sit within. So just to give you a bit of a sense of that, there's something about, there's something around 830,000 kids sitting within the New Zealand education system and about 22,000 of those kids are being taught in the medium of um, Reo Māori and from the ministry's perspective that's kids that are learning anywhere from 50 to 100% of the time in Reo Māori. They're, they're differentially funded for the percentage of time they're spent learning in, in the medium of Māori. Um, those kids are achieving very well in that system. That system works exceptionally well for them. Um, close to 165,000 kids who are, are statistically identify as Māori are in the English medium system and those kids are the ones that are being underserved. Um, just a, a quick step back because I wanted to give you a sense of how our system is made up in terms of its complexity. So um, in those 830,000 learners, uh, about 700,000 of them sit within uh, what's called a state um, system. So it's a system that's entirely funded by the government. And the expectation is that those schools adhere to one of these documents. Now I'm just talking about, um, so I'm going to be clear, I'm talking about the compulsory system. So there are, um, uh, the exception being the, the accreditable um, sector. Um, a nearly 95,000 kids uh, sit within a school that's considered uh, integrated. So that might be an example of that is uh, quite often religious schools um, or special character schools like the Steiner or Montessori schools are considered integrated. They're state integrated. They're, that means they're entirely funded by the state, but the state recognises the special character of that school and that they're allowed to do the teaching and learning that's specific to whatever the system is. So quite often in religious schools there's a religious education allowance that isn't part of these curriculum but the expectation is that they still adhere to these documents um, and then we have about um, 30,000 nearly 31,000 kids who are in private schools and those schools um, they receive a little bit of funding that just accounts for the fact that their parents will be paying a tax that allows for free education so they get that kind of subsidy made but the expectation is that the families pay for that education and they can follow whichever curriculum suits them and there's no requirement on them for that. Um, yeah, where did I get to? So, yeah, so ultimately I think the uh, entirely unique system uh, with its own problems and partly when you're a self-governing school with a curriculum framework that overarches rather than defines what you're going to be doing, what you end up with is quite a lot of variation right across the system, um, which can be quite hard to keep up with in terms of how do we support those teachers to do the best for those kids. Um, and so if you imagine the types of diversity across yeah. all of those two and a half thousand schools in the country, what is it? What can curriculum support look like? Um, ultimately, there's no way of knowing what a school is teaching until you ask them. We have practically somewhere in the vicinity of two and a half thousand individual curriculums operating curricula operating in the country. Um, and so that's why I think uh, the role that you, all of you play in the system, we're all part of a wider ecosystem of learning and schools are part of that, but so are museums, so are um, art galleries, so are zoos, libraries, they are all part of the system. And when you think about the complexity of the job that teachers do in the classroom, trying to, trying to work through how do they serve all the different needs of the kids in their class in a way that is, adheres to their own school-based curriculum, as well as aligns appropriately to the national curriculum. And then there's a bunch of legal stuff as well in terms of national um, education expectations and guidelines. Um, it is quite a complex job to filter all that down into something that becomes really rich and really engaging and helps progress kids' learning. Um, and so that's where I think any help that can be provided to the formal education system in whatever form, especially the types that come from museums, galleries, zoos, libraries, who, it's our job as institutions to be educators, whichever way you look at it, um, is, uh, is a massive thing. Um, and schools, 
being part of helping a teacher so the teachers are not on their own trying to come up with all of this information themselves, I think is a really critical part of our role. It's really interesting how, just how you've described our New Zealand education system, because I'm aware that some overseas countries um, have curriculum that are very prescriptive. You know, you need to be on a certain page of the curriculum each day. So no matter whether you're in whichever classroom around the country, um, teachers will be teaching to that page of the curriculum. So it's really interesting to hear about the flexibility and the freedom mm -hmm. our education system has. Yeah, I think it's one of the real strengths. It provides some challenges, no doubt, but it's one of the real strengths that we have in New Zealand that our curriculum, and this is where we get to school-based curriculum and local curriculum design, schools determine what is the appropriate context and learning and opportunities that they provide for their kids. And they do that with the support of their community when things are operating well. It's not a thing, it is a thing that schools find very difficult to do, to be fully um, cognizant of community need and expectation. But if you imagine the difference between a system where a central government agency says every kid in the country is learning this information at this time compared to a system where um, schools that are completely integrated and part of a community have conversations about what the expectations and aspirations of that community are for their learners. Then you end up offering something that's much more tailored, much more localised, much more appropriate for those kids. Um, and when it's working really well, it is a beautiful thing to see. Um, we see kids, you know, there's, um, there's something that we, that old adage of education in terms of mirrors and windows. So kids have an opportunity to see themselves reflected in what they're learning, but they also see that learning as a way of opening themselves up to the world. So being able to get that balance right when you are closer to kids is an easier task. I feel immense pride when I hear our curriculum talked about, and it doesn't matter um, how often I hear it, the fact that we do have that freedom and flexibility. And I think for our teachers, that means that we're more able to dis design curriculum and programs of learning for the needs of every child in our class rather than that standardised approach. Yeah. So Pam, I guess that leads me to a question saying, what, what, how do schools work with that in their curriculum? How You talked a little bit before about local curriculum and, and working with community to design. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means for schools when they're thinking about their program? Yeah, so there's been quite a lot of talk about local curriculum more recently in the last um, year or so, but it's something that's been around ever since the New Zealand curriculum was written in 2007. Yes. <laughs> And, and it is also a feature of the motto, which is 2008, one year later. And I'm just going to add to Tāriki because I'm early Tariki. childhood, 1996, well, I think. Tāriki started this out. Yeah. And actually, um, interestingly, the way that we think about learning in the youngest years has been a huge influence on how we've thought about learning all the way through. The, the idea of um, key competencies, the idea of localization, the idea of flexibility and play and exploration all come from the work that happened here. So well done those EC guys. Tara, high five to you. Um, but back to uh, local curriculum. So on page 37 of the New Zealand curriculum, there's three pages, which is quite a lot of this document, it's not a big document, three pages all about school curriculum review and assessment. And this is where it lays out the expectation that schools use this as guidance to create their own curriculum. It has had a resurgence lately and referred to as local curriculum design. And the other thing I've noticed is often that can be uh, subsumed with place-based learning. So we have to take a little bit of care. So place-based learning is a part of local curriculum design, but it's not all of local curriculum design. When we think about um, how, what is it that our kids in our community need to progress their learning? Partly that's about understanding their place and where they're from and what connections around them um, they can make and what they can draw on to build that knowledge. But it's also about what are the things that make sense for them in terms of progress, their literacy understanding or their conceptual understanding of science. What is, how do you put your curriculum together that meets the needs of the learners? not just the context that you're teaching. So um, I don't know if you're familiar, but there is currently the ministry's embarking in on a entire curriculum review. It's a five year process and it began uh, a few months ago. 
we might be six months in, I think, or mm -hmm. I'm speaking off the top of my head, so I might be wrong on that, but um, we're at the early stages of full curriculum review, and one of the features of that review that has recently been um, endorsed by the minister, so it is something that's going to roll out, is this concept, a framework called um, Understand, Know and Do. Now, if you've had a close look at the Aotearoa New Zealand History's curriculum change, in the um, overview A3 for the New Zealand curriculum, the English medium change, they, they're at the top corner there's a little icon that refers to know, understand, do. So what schools, this has been the, the case all along, but they're making it much more explicit now. Um, what schools will do to create their own local curriculum is to pull together what are the things that they, that the intention is for their kids to understand, so conceptually understand what's the, what's the shift in big picture understanding that's happening with this learning, um, what do they need to know, so what is the information, and what do, they want them, what do we want them to be able to do with that information. And so a really rich program of learning weaves those three concepts together. And it is something that um, people who haven't worked in education a lot forget that education is about more than the mm. stuff you're learning. The stuff you're learning is critically important because you can't learn con uh, concepts or skills and capabilities without context, but you can't, but a context alone is not enough. Kids need to be making progress in their conceptual understanding and they need to um, get a grasp and have a chance to try what they can do with that knowledge and skills and how they might apply it in the future. Um, and so a school will, um, optimally, a school will have a consultation with their community. Hopefully they've got great relationships in their community so they can draw on the knowledge and skills and, and capabilities in their local community. Uh, they'll draw on the relationship, hopefully, the relationship that they have with their local iwi and hapu. Um, and uh, bring all that knowledge and expectation and, under and understanding of the world into their thinking. Look at the data of the achievement of their kids so far. So all schools are keeping data about the progress that kids are making. So they'll look at that and understand where they need to put more energy, who needs to be supported more. And then they'll have a think about what's going on in the world and what are the really rich and engaging contexts that kids are going to engage, uh, going to kind of really turn on to. What are the things that they want to teach in that period of time? Um, so the expectation from the national curriculum is that kids have an experience of all curriculum areas across the whole lifetime, uh, their um, uh, spans of time that they have in the formal education system. And typically years one to three will just be about, predominantly be about gaining the skills to engage with the curriculum. So they're learning to read, they're learning to write, they're learning to be critical thinkers, they're learning to engage with each other. That's for the first three years. They do that in context of information, but the primary purpose is to learn the skills of learning. Um, the next chunk of time, all the way up to year 10, is about gaining a breadth of curriculum. So across all of those curriculum areas, gaining enough foundation to be able to go on to further study if that's what they choose. Because after you, year 10, kids are starting to choose what they are interested in and what they prefer to do. Um, and so having enough uh, time experiencing the arts, having enough time experiencing science to give them enough information to be able to decide if that's what they want to keep doing. So all about learning the skills, then all about getting breadth. And if, if you understand that if by year three kids don't have those basic skills to engage with the rest of the curriculum, they very quickly run out of time to um, move at the same pace that the rest of the class is doing. And that's where we often see kids start to struggle because from year four, year five, they're starting to pick up new language, new terminology, new skills around uh, discipline specific things and that can get a little bit struggly there. So um, often kids at years one to three are so focused on the tools of learning that there isn't as much time spent on the, the knowledge and context and richness of, of understanding that could happen at those years. So that's something to think about when you're putting together your own programs of learning in your own spaces um, thinking about if you've got years one to three kids coming in, what, what are you what are you going to back the teacher up with in terms of knowledge that supports them to expand that 
expand that opportunity for kids. Yeah, really interesting the way you've described it and thinking about those chunks of time. And you know, when I think about our youngest learners, those essential years, you know, the years one to three that you were talking about are crucial for getting that skill development in because you're right, that's when we start to see the gaps in our system with students who struggle. And it really um, makes me sad when I see our secondary students who are still struggling with their literacy, um, with some of those basic skills that prevent them from, from gaining or getting deeper into that content. The other thing that um, what you've just said has reminded me of is that a New Zealand system is what's known as a standards-based system. So um, not until you get to NCEA are there any formal and consistently applied assessment tools. So um, nobody follows a standardised test. Um, there are tools in the system that allows teachers to individually determine where they think their kids are at. But there is no tool that collectively measures all kids across the system. And the tools that do exist are quite often normed. And by normed, you know, you understand the concept of norming someone. So you, you kind of fit against the curve. Um, whereas NCA and what and this the kind of expectations that are outlined in the curriculum are standardized. Mm -hmm. And what, what that means is not it doesn't mean that they are the same for everyone. It means that what should you expect kids to understand by this point in their schooling, not to judge the kids, but to determine whether or not you need to give them more or different support. Um, so the recognition in the system is about what have kids achieved so far and what else can you offer them rather than saying, yep, they've met the line and yep, they're ready to go on and tick, tick, tick. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to take a slight deviation here. Um, the last change that we had to the curriculum was around the revised technology learning area that saw a, a focus in on digital technologies. And um, that came about not from education just wanting that, but it came about of that all of government digital nations where government looked and said, actually, digital is the future workforce. We need to be supporting not only um, our workers into this, but we need to be supporting our, our younger students or our, our students in the formal system so they can come out of the formal education system with a set of, of skills that help support digital technologies. When they released that revised technology learning, they talked a lot about progress outcomes in there. And that's something we've seen with the draft Aotearoa New Zealand Histories content too. Can you talk a little bit about progress outcomes in their intent? Yeah. So um, in the 2007 New Zealand curriculum, um, and similarly in the Marautanga, there were kind of achievement, achievement objectives, right? So you understand the achievement objectives. They're things that you're going to be achieving at certain times. Those are generally not mapped across a conceptual kind of timeline, um, and they don't generally work together. So the intention of the progress outcomes is not about the stuff, but about the big shift of ideas. So mm. they wouldn't happen every year. They wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't necessarily take the same amount of learning to go from one conceptual idea to the next. It might be a concept that for digital te technology, it might take two or three years of learning to be able to expect to get to the next conceptual idea. Um, and those conceptual ideas open up understanding for more complex learning. That's the whole point of it. So the progress outcomes are there to indicate what you might expect learners to conceptually understand and how sort of with a bit of a sense of how long you how much learning you might expect it to take between one and the next. So it's lifting learning up a level. It isn't learn, you know, do a unit on the treaty and then do a unit on the Rocky Shore, I'm just thinking back to my own education, and then do a unit on something else. It is about kind of going, actually, we want kids to understand this idea and the next idea we want them to understand is this one. And how they get from there to there, well, that's up to the teacher and the community and, and whoever else is sitting around, that's for them to decide. So it's a really good idea. And um, as I understand it in the curriculum review, progress outcomes will continue through the curriculum. They're considered to be much more effective and supportive for teachers to understand what to do than the achievement objectives are in the current curriculum. Mm -hmm. So I do expect progress outcomes to continue. 
Um, and if I, you know, I would suggest that you all have a really close look at the progress outcomes of the Aotearoa New Zealand curriculum. Now the new, the consultation is finished and the feedback is in and has been released, but the new framing, the new changes hasn't been released yet. There are some people who have seen it, but it hasn't been released publicly yet. But have a look at the one that's there already, because it, in terms of the structure, it will it'll have something quite similar to it. And you'll start to see the difference in terms of how those progress outcomes are put together. One of the things I liked when I saw the progress outcomes in the Aotearoa New Zealand Histories curriculum content, as opposed to the revised technology learning area focused on DT, was the simplified language in the digital technologies area. It was very complex. Um, it was rich language, so I'm not saying it's not, but it actually involved a whole lot of terms that our, our teachers didn't understand because they didn't go through teacher education understanding that. What I loved in the Aotearoa histories one was that it was an everyday language, language that kids could pick up and see their own and mark their own progress in there. And I think that's a really nice way as we go forward that that our students can identify where they are at and what their next learning achievement is as well. So, or next learning objective, as mm -hmm. I should say. So it's good to see that focus coming through in the curriculum refresh. And, and that's the way it should be. And like, yeah. I think either ourselves or our kids or as in classroom, we would have all had an experience of someone saying, well, what's the point of learning mm -hmm. this? And the progress outcomes are about articulating the point. Yeah. The point of learning this is these understandings that you can take forward. And they're not designed as a checkbox either. Once you've ticked them off, that's it, they're done and dusted. Actually, it's an ongoing progress. Right. And you could be working across different progress outcomes as well. That's right. And they're not, they're not, um, some of them do fit with a year by year study just because that's the way they fit. But it isn't about that. It isn't that at year one, this is what you're supposed to study. You can move through them at the rate that the kids are demonstrating their understanding. And there's an example of that when I was at the ministry, a very early test of progress outcomes as a concept was performed across uh, within the health and PE curriculum on nutrition and um, the, the learning that's around nutrition. And uh, I was working with Mary Chamberlain. Some of you may know her from Evaluation Associates. And Mary walked into a class to test the idea of progress outcomes and realized that those kids had very little experience of any of the learning in nutrition that's in the curriculum. So in order for her to test the progress outcomes, she needed to get kids to a, a certain level of understanding appropriate for them. And she worked with them for a month and managed to make her way through all of the progress outcomes for those kids at that, at that age. Um, so you know, you can actually, it can mix and match in different ways, and that's part of the flexibility. You're not re you're not uh, restricted to teaching certain things at certain levels. If the kids are ready to move on, if they're ready to understand, then move on with them and go where the kids are. It's a lovely piece of background progress outcomes, <laughs> I didn't know. So that's great to be able to have that. And Monica, I'm going to throw something at you. Um, Monica uh, led a piece of work with the Raranga Matahiko program on the... Uh, putting kids speak really for the progress outcome for the te digital technologies curriculum. And it might be useful just to share that so that if people haven't seen the um, progress outcomes for Aotearoa New Zealand history, so they can see how um, we took the complex ones and broke them down, but there's no need to do that for histories, but just yeah. shows you how uh, it can work with students. It, that leads us really nicely on to integrated curriculum. There's been a lot of talk about integrated curriculum coming through, and this is something where I think our cultural and heritage spaces can do really well. We've seen through the Raranga Matihiko program that's been running over the last three and a half years um, that Te Papa's led, but has involved Auckland Museum, Auckland Art Gallery, MTG Hawks Bay, Waikato Museum, Waitangi Treaty Grounds, and I feel as though I've forgotten one of our other partners. And Te Papa. <laughs> and Te Papa. Um, but that's one of the things our cultural and heritage places can give our schools and help support them with is understanding how you weave together uh, different subjects that you don't just need to teach subjects in silo basis. Actually, there's something about drawing on that authentic, rich context that we do when we talk about design programs in our spaces. How do you see integrated curriculum going with this curriculum refresh? Um, I think it's a really critical part of it. So, more, um, there's a lot of complexity to the curriculum. 
And when you think about, if you think about it in pieces, it's actually too much to achieve within years one to um, 12 or 13 of the curriculum. Um, so trying to, trying to uh, spending a, a certain period of time on each curriculum area is actually physically impossible. You have to think about learning in a connected way. And it also doesn't make sense logically to teach in disciplines because the world doesn't work in disciplines. So integrated curriculum is just very simply finding within a really rich task or rich opportunity to learn, finding the correct, the multiple curriculum links. So start with the richness of the task and map it to the curriculum rather than go, we've got to teach some science and then going back from that direction. Um, a really great example now, did I think of one just before and it would have, uh, would have escaped me? Ah, so um, some teaching and learning. So many of you will be familiar with um, the artwork In Pursuit of Venus Infected by Lisa Rehana. If you don't have a look at it online, it's a pretty amazing piece of work. Um, that shows a contemporary artist making a contemporary comment on the world that she sees around her now. But it's based on the DeFore wallpaper, which is a very historic piece of, of work, um, a piece of art, which presented a comment on the world that was seen by that artist back then. Um, and there's, in order to be able to present that work, Lisa has had to understand and research and engage with a lot of New Zealand's history, a lot of history of the Pacific, um, a lot of cultural norms, and um, uh, and you know there's just a there's so much of her understanding comes out in this work in order for her to make a contemporary um, comment. So when you think about curriculum links, there's a lot of Aotearoa and New Zealand histories within social sciences. There's a lot of the art curriculum, understanding her practice, how she's put things together, her process from um, early designs through to the final product. Um, and then in terms of the understand, know and do, the ability to be able to present that in a way that engages other people in in that understanding and go on that journey with her to understand what her own response was to the DeFore wallpaper and what inspired her to create her new artwork. So there's, there's activities within that that engages all of those aspects of the curriculum, which are incredible, it's an incredibly rich way to engage in curriculum mm. learning. Um, and as you can imagine, when you reflect on, you know, I talked about the diversity of the system, the diversity that sits in the classroom, the requirements on teachers actually being backed up by people such as yourselves going, actually, this is what we have in our museum. This is what we have in our zoo. This is what we've got in our science centre that can help you unpack all of those curriculum areas. Um, that's going to be like a life breath to teachers because it is a, it, like I keep keep talking about how hard it is to actually really effectively pull those things together. And if a teacher knows that they have the support of these institutions around them, then it's a, it's a weight off their mind that they've got some really good content knowledge, they've got some really great curriculum connections, and someone's done that integration work for them. Um, we can do it with our content, and we can do it once with our content and serve you know, 30, 40 different classrooms. Um, yeah. For efficiency's sake, it's a win. Yeah. <laughs> um, the UNESCO often talk about this notion of learning cities, which I know I talk about a lot too, because I really like that idea of that wider community wrapping around individual schools to support them. So regardless of whether it's your local library, your local gallery, aquarium, or um, even your local garage, for example, going where the knowledge is held in that community, because teachers bless them, they can't be experts in absolutely everything. So spaces like some of our science centres have ex, um, experts in certain particular areas, as do others. And I think within our Raranga Matihiko programme that we've been running about across our museums, it was a contract that we won from the Ministry of Education to support the digital technology area. But that was one of the last things that we talked to, we, we, we put into the programme planning. So schools would come in and have a two-day program with us, but we'd started with what the kids were learning about. What was the inquiry that was happening in the classroom? And the one thing I have learned, well, I've learned lots over the last four years, but the one thing is, is how well and how responsive our sector is to being able to support schools, not only in being able to 
plan rich programs of learning that support the school curriculum, but actually um, showing teachers how we can do that. Um, teachers are, are still learning that, you know, that curriculum integration. I think there's real opportunity for us to continue to support our teachers in that way. Um, it was a long time ago, but I remember I distinctly remember the moment where it kind of occurred to me that um, the schooling is a construct and it's made up of constructs. And when we sit in these in these spaces, surrounded by stories, reflections of community, artworks that are built on um, genuine, um, real life occurrences. That's the realness. The realness sits in the stories and the objects and the artworks that we um, we advocate for. And the system is just a construct of organizing resources around mm. it. So let's help open up that realness, that authenticity of learning for kids. Mm. Now I'm not suggesting that that doesn't happen in schools. Of course it happens in schools. It happens a lot and it happens incredibly well most of the time but it is a big ask and we're here to support it. So yeah. that's one of the things that can be most yeah. meaningful in terms of our work. And it's access to objects in Tonga that they wouldn't normally have. Like I remember when one of the, the programs that Laura, one of our educators at Papa ran, oh, yeah. um, when we first started was, um, there was a local Wellington school learning about the wearable arts and they were creating their own wearable costumes. And through Laura and a curator, or it was a collection manager, I think, we had three wearable arts items come out of storage um, that the kids could actually look at and study. And we had, a, a, I think it was actually a conservator, talk about the fabric and the way that the designers could put these together. And what it meant for these students who got this close up look of these three garments, but they could, they understood the knowledge and things to think about when they pulled their own items together at school. And it was one of those first times that I thought, how how influential we can be in children's learning on an ongoing impact and, and I guess lifelong learning really. Yeah. So as cultural and heritage practitioners, how do you see us fitting to support the curriculum? Apart from what we've just talked about, what, yeah. what are the other ways that you can see us as helping schools, helping our learners in our communities? I mean, I, I think about these spaces, the spaces where we work, the diversity of these spaces where we work as life as places of lifelong learning. Um, and so opening up these places for our young people to believe belong to them, I think is a really critical part of everybody's journey. We know that there are a lot of people who don't feel like they belong, say, in a museum. A museum is by its very de definition a, a colonial uh, construct. Um, and those places are not felt to be welcoming. And so if through our support for learning, we can become a place where kids feel they belong, that they have some say, that they can be part of, um, and they carry that through into their life, it means that that learning doesn't, doesn't stop when it's facilitated by a teacher and an educator, but it continues into their lives. Um, and we know, you know, we all are here because we believe um, very essentially how important these places are in terms of uh, preserving our stories and, and providing perspectives and continuing learning through life. Um, so uh, that's the big picture. Uh, in the practical sense, I think um, building the relationships with schools that ensures that we don't end up being the end of term kind of celebratory mm. teachers switched off, hand over the kids to the educator, end of term visit, but become a critical central part of the teaching and learning of whatever unit that they're doing. And what I found here is that it takes some, it takes some persuasion to schools mm. because if they're not thinking of using us this way, then that's not what they're going to be doing. They're not going to be asking for that from us. And so it's taken time building relationships, having conversations, working alongside, prompting and providing more each time to start turning over teachers' views that actually they can come here and ask for more than what they might have expected in the first instance. Um, so having a sense of how we might be able to design with and for teachers, perhaps um, teacher advisory groups where you have them and going, actually, what's going to most work for you? Mm. Um, I'm not suggesting that everything that we do is bespoke to an individual curriculum because actually we might not be able to resource that, but 
we will get a sense from working with groups and the teachers what those sort of commonly asked for themes are and how we might adjust to fit that. And I think about it here at Tapapa to be less about our exhibition and what we want people to know and more about what is our audience trying to achieve and how can we align to that. And sometimes that works best because we've got an exhibition showing, but sometimes we have nothing uh, nominally on the floor that aligns to that. Um, and I know some of our team are here in the group and they'll be like, Yes, we have to go all over the museum connecting the story so that we can pull together the support that the school needs. Um, and we have the richness of being able to do that across across the building and sometimes from uh, back of house and sometimes from outside in the outside of the building. So, yeah. I like that notion of partnership, seeing how we can really help enhance that learning opportunity. Pam, coming from the Ministry of Education into Te Papa or a cultural and heritage sector, what do you think our sector should be doing um, and how do you see our organisation supporting teaching and learning? So again, it's an extension of that, but if you think in the bigger picture, you've come from the MOE where they're setting the system, creating um, environments that foster great opportunities for our young people to learn, and now you're in the cultural and heritage mm -hmm. space doing the same but from a different perspective. So how can we help help more? Well, a little bit of, a little bit of it is about why we're starting with this kind of overview of the system is to actually get um, try to get as close to understanding what teachers are trying to achieve as possible um, so that we can bring everything that we've got to that problem um, from the you know if you if, if I was sitting in the ministry um, the demands are huge the demands of the education system are huge and the ministry is trying to take care of them in lots of different ways it's actually a massive relief to think that there are institutions out in the community who care about learning for young people and are doing their best every day to support that because it's just another thing to not have to worry about. Um, I would always want it to see it to, as something that uh, is, is aligning to what the teachers are trying to achieve. So if the teachers are struggling to understand Aotearoa New Zealand histories and feel uncomfortable in that space, because that's what they're telling us, then we need to line up alongside them and give them whatever support we can so that they're feeling more comfortable. Um, that's what I think is of serving, serving our young people is serving their teachers to be able to do a better job serving them. And that's about finding out what they need, not thinking about what we're trying to promote. Yeah. yeah. So you touched on advisory groups earlier and having a group of teachers and advisors, but equally too, we could be holding um, monthly teacher network meetings or maybe even termly um, teacher evenings where they can come along and we can just have a discussion about what they want. But we can also, I think because Aotearoa New Zealand Histories is so, um, is the next big curriculum change. And as you've identified, we've had a lot of teachers tell us that they don't feel prepared for it. Um, and I really feel fear, and I'm not going to get into my feelings around the history, but I wouldn't like students to be sitting in a classroom learning about histories from a PowerPoint in a screen when they're learning about the local awa or the local local manga where they could be at and experiencing it in all its richness. But I won't get started <laughs> on that. But but I, I guess what I'm thinking is one of the things that our sector could be doing to support teachers is to have maybe those termly evenings where mm -hmm. you come along and we share an aspect of our local history. And maybe it's not just us. Maybe we invite local iwi and things mm -hmm. like that. Is that something that you would see as beneficial? Yeah, I mean, no, that you've touched on something that can, is quite... Um, quite challenging mm -hmm. in the system. I think we all need to think in our own spaces really carefully about the roles that we should be playing mm -hmm. and stand what platforms we should be standing on and when it might be more appropriate to involve others. But it's it's possible that we might hold relationships and, and connections that schools don't hold and can be something of a conduit for that. Mm -hmm. I think there's some, some real value in that. Possibly, um, you know, you mentioned involving iwi. I think, particularly in relation to the New Zealand curriculum, the um, Aotearoa New Zealand Histories curriculum, a lot of those primary stories are referencing the stories of iwi and hapu, which is exactly where that should be. Um, but your local iwi and hapu might be overwhelmed with inquiries from schools. And so, is there a way to use your own relationship to help? take the pressure off or 
provide a forum for iwi to come and share their stories to a greater number of schools or you know think really literally about the role that you could play to help play this out um, when you're thinking about the pressures that everyone in the system is is under and, and what can we do kind of sitting in the middle mm. Look, we've done a lot of talking and I was going to pause throughout to see what comments mm -hmm. were coming in. We are going to have Q&A when we finish in about five to ten minutes. But I'm just going to pause now and Monica, Mel, see if there are any questions that came in that I have completely ignored while we've been having a really great conversation. You can see Mel shaking her head. Monica, no, no questions. So that is um, fantastic. We, as I said, we will pause shortly and open up the floor um, to you. Um, I'm just thinking, Pam, you're a mother of two, two young girls, they're at primary school. As a parent, what do you want to see when you're, you, you know your girls are going out into their local cultural and heritage sector, which I happen to know is partaker for you. Um, yeah. 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 What, what do you hope they receive when they go to places like that or on their local excursions? Well, I mean, I, I recognise that my kids are really privileged to be um, the offspring of someone who works at a museum. And honestly, when my kids come in here, they do strut around like they own, own the place. And I think actually that's what I want for all kids. I want kids to come in and feel like they own the place, that it's theirs. Um, and, you know, I referenced that previously, but for kids in, you know, I'm, I'm from Titahi Bay and Porirua, for kids to feel like te, uh, Pataka is their own space, that they can come and use that, that they can go and um, explore the questions that they have through what Pataka does, which is fabulous, by the way, um, that Pataka is part of our school community's network of knowledge and information, which is also called, cool, by the way. Um, yeah, I just want kids to feel like they own it. Mm. And, and, you know, I try to share through my kids um, as many opportunities to kind of go, actually, we've got massive resources in these institutions. Even the smallest of our institutions have got massive resources that schools don't mm. have their hands on. And how can we make that feel like it belongs to everyone wanting to learn? Mm. What are the ways that we can do yeah. that? And I think there's real benefit in that. Like I think one of the programs our learning team does, Donald, Laura, and the rest of the learning team, is we have a Gallipoli Perspectives program that involves drawing on the scale of our war exhibition. But then there's part that takes uh, place in the void around a sort of virtual reality, augmented reality experience. We're getting kids to reflect on their emotions of what they've seen through an exhibition that is um, quite emotional and can be overwhelming. And what I remember when they, we were first testing the program and standing out there and watching the adults, the visitors that had come to the museum, watching the kids engage with the content and the storyline and, and showcasing their emotions. And I remember one elderly couple, his wife was in the gift shop and he just stood there for ages and then he went and got his wife and they stood there and just watched these kids and then got involved with conversation. And I, I don't know what the conversation was about, but... It was just they were really interested in watching the kids' response to that particular um, exhibition, but also having that conversation with them. So, in my, at, you know, when you're saying about kids making the space their own, there's real benefits to our places from that as well. I did a little bit of. Um, I went to a. Uh, um, engaged with the process in, with Singapore, and they were introducing. Uh, they made it a compulsory part of their art curriculum, actually, that all the learners in Singapore would visit museums and this was a very new part of their curriculum and I remember going into the museums because we've been doing it for years um, and they were talking about how we engage young people in the museums and I was just you know I was talking about how you can get new perspectives on art by kids lying down on the floor and looking at the art from between their feet and honestly they were horrified <laughs> about the certain behaviors of an art gallery but you know, that's the thing. People do carry that sense, uh, particularly in art galleries and museums, the sense is that these are places for adults to quietly walk around and read the labels and not a place for kids to lie on the floor and look at artwork through from between their feet. Yeah. But actually, that's what it's here for. Um, and if I don't see a kid lying upside down in a museum on any good day, I think it's not a good day for learning. So. Yeah. Fantastic. Look, I think we might pause here for questions. I had a whole lot of other things around um, hidden curriculums, unteaching racism, modern learning environments, but we might have to invite you back for a second session at some point. But I'm just going to pause here and, and we're going to mute ourselves and see if there is any questions from the floor. So 
feel free to uh, unmute yourself. We might do a hand raising system um, because I'm sure lots of you would like to take the opportunity to ask Pam some questions. So maybe raise your hand if you've got a question um, and then we'll uh, let you have the mic. Monica, I can see that there might have been some questions coming through. If there were, would you mind uh, just reading them out while um, we, I've just lost the ability to see the questions and go back into the chat? Um, so there was um, just a few um, comments in there. Um, quite a few of them were just the links that I put in there. Um, there were some comments in there, like by Steve, um, about um, in the UK, trainee teachers do a placement as part of their teaching qualification in an informal learning venue or site to get a better understanding about how to integrate those sites in the classroom. Now, I think that's a fabulous idea. Um, I know from my experience at Waitangi that we've had some um, teacher trainee groups come through. And um, I remember one particular instance uh, where they very much, uh, there was a lot of excitement about understanding how they would fit together. So that would be really cool. Um, Laura commented how she really liked the idea of those network evenings. And I think those network evenings could be a really good idea. They could be um, in a more uh, urbanized area. They might be harder or easier uh, because more people are around. Um, I'm, uh, I well understand Barbara who has put a comment a little bit further down where uh, she said her most, the most responses she has received is after she visited schools face to face, talk to them about their needs while people sort of ignore emails, don't they? And we probably all have experienced that, that when we email schools, you know, it's yet another email in their inbox and it might just disappear. But once they step foot on, uh, it's interact with people who are involved, step a foot into our spaces, people usually go like, wow, I didn't know we could. So that's sort of the summary of um, the different comments. Um, mm -hmm. Mel just put a lovely comment in there, inviting teachers in alone could be very beneficial to spark ideas and discussions and sort of co-create a tailored mini program before a class is ever brought in. Absolutely agree. Um, I know that at Whiting we often say to the teachers and adults, come back some other time without the kids so you can actually, mm -hmm. you know, um, do things at your leisure, but it's, it's um, almost more important to bring them in beforehand mm -hmm. and have a chat to them. Now, it's not suitable at every venue, but um, just thinking back to my teacher days, um, events that involve um, beverages and snacks um, after <laughs> school, um, I, I'm not going to say of, of what kind, um, they would usually be quite attractive to me as a teacher. Um, Timanawa, Staff, Kirsty, Himani, and Miriam just talking about, oh yes, thank you, Laura, I was thinking she's the one, <laughs> but our Timanawa colleagues were just saying they tried a special invite evening for teachers who, uh, where we toured them around our spaces and talked about new programs, and then we went into an opening with a glass of wine, excellent timing, oh my gosh, I think I need to come and visit a few of your guys' places. Yes. You know, I've done a few, um, teacher events over the years whether it's been in the cultural and heritage space or through other things you can offer all the free events in the world that you want but the registration numbers and the attendance always at least doubles if not more if you offer wine and through laura i've learned cheese as well <laughs> um it's amazing what just a couple of little things like that can offer and i know not everyone can um do that but it's it's a good opportunity um keely you've got your hand up for a question um, Kia ora. Um, I'm just interested to know if anyone has um, already run a sort of histories curriculum based get together with teachers um, because we've obviously been doing our own research and things and, and, and there's just like such a broad amount of stuff that they could look at and I was wondering how you've picked out which things teachers are interested or how you've given them the information without overwhelming them with you know everything that you've read and every book that you've found and every person that of interest how how you've decided on which bits to pick out as the main stories monica i um, take it a response to that yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I am um, funnily enough I had a conversation uh, with, the, uh, with one of the team at Waitahi about um, something like this today Keely um, uh, uh, they were thinking about how they could support teachers 
so I haven't run it yet, but um, just the ideas I went past the boss. There's two different aspects really that one could talk about. One of them could be how do you teach this in your context? And you know, there is two and a half thousand schools, so you know, two and a half thousand different ways, and then the different year levels. But you could also use the whole idea of understand, know, and do, and apply that to the teacher learning and have a look at where in the curriculum does it touch to things that you know, and how can you help uh, the teachers to do certain things, like to understand the causes and consequences of something that's relevant in your exhibition, um, or how could they um, critique what happened in the past? I mean, I was thinking of it in the uh, in the uh, frame of the Waitangi Treaty Grounds, that you would say like things like, um, would this still be okay today to have two different versions of um, a treaty document, and they say two completely different things, you know, this kind of stuff. And you would then just help the teachers build up their knowledge so that they can then go and use their knowledge of their students, how they work with their students, how it fits into the school. And they could go like, yay, now I know more and I can understand that. So just two different approaches. Um, one of them might be a little bit easier to facilitate than the other because um, I couldn't see my chances um, to uh, cover 2,500 schools needs. But there will be other people who will have exactly those ideas that they can share with the schools and go like, hey, I know how you can teach this to your kids at that year level. And I think too, Keely, just following on, um, we know that there's some professional learning and development going to be wrapped around this for teachers in the sector. But from what I can see is it tends to be fairly much run by secondary teachers who have their own special areas of need. So when we think about our primary teachers in that authentic context, the curriculum integration like Pam was talking about before, how can we help support them to upskill their knowledge so they're not just teaching it in that very secondary, um, and I don't want to generalise about secondary teachers, but generally most of them teach in very siloed subject areas, particularly as you get into NCEA. So how can we support our, teach, uh, our teachers to understand it from a primary level? So I think our spaces have a responsibility in some ways to do that in the ways that we can. The other way that Papa has been engaging is in um, asking teachers to contribute their thinking and the work that we're planning on putting together. So there'll be contexts and things that we are particularly rich to be able to share in this in our in our spaces. And so, you know, we want to pull something together that's useful for teachers that supports their teaching and learning. So we go to go to the teachers and say, actually, if we were doing this, what would be the most useful to you? Mm. Um, and then we can contribute to their to them in some way with maybe a free visit or a virtual excursion or whatever it is within our ability to provide to recognise their effort in supporting us. Um, it, it meets a number of needs. It helps us uh, develop something that's particularly useful, but it also helps teachers understand the type of work that we're trying to do for them and kind of gives them a bit of a, an insight into what they could ask us for in the future. That's been really successful because we're we're working to what we have without any requests so far from schools to say, can you do this, that, and the next thing. Is that the Papa at the National Museum? We can probably sit on some of the really um, national big stories, um, but when you're in a regional space, you have the benefit of having a really local story to be telling, and that's part of where schools logically are going to start. They'll mm. start with where is their school, what is the story of the place, where did it get its name, what's the history of that. You know, starting very locally, it's just a really mm. nice, not necessarily easy, but nice first step into mm. it. Remember that Aotearoa New Zealand History's curriculum shift sits within social science, social studies curriculum. It's a piece of the social studies curriculum. And we all know that term one, social studies, is about where am I, who am I, where do I fit, where do I fit in the world? Where is my community? Those ideas will continue and we'll just be able to do them through the lens of New Zealand histories you know, as context. And I'm just going to add to that before, there's a couple of comments on the chat that I want to come to um, before we finish up. But that notion of us working together as a sector across this work, like Treaty of Waitangi obviously is a huge focus within the curriculum um, document for histories as it should be. That's obviously got a national approach to it in terms of you can't change the, the, the signing of the treaty and the, the stories landed up to it. But it's also got a very local context 
when you think about what was happening in my community at this time when the treaty was being signed and what was the impact afterwards. So how can we work together to be able to tell that national story, but then bring it back down to that local story as well. So um, I'm hoping that through this next 15 months together, we can start to, to, mm. to try and collaborate a little bit more and work on some of those things so that we are more united and we're working smarter as a sector to be able to really help support teachers as they're coming to grips with their, their knowledge. I mean, when I was training as a teacher, there was certainly no, um, no content on our history. I mean, I learned about the history of education, but not about the history of New Zealand, apart from the education perspective. And our teachers are really feeling it. So, you know, about us and the ideas that are coming through. Um, Ruth has shared that um, they find going to syndicate and staff meetings works really well when teachers are planning a particular topic. And I think that's a, a really good idea too, you know, finding all those ways that we can, that are manageable for us in the workloads we have. So we don't want to put more work on us, but how can we work smarter to be able to, to really support teachers because they're going to be needing the help. And, mm -hmm. and I really think our cultural and heritage sector is one of those places that can really support that learning. Yeah, I think um, the consultation material for Aotearoa New Zealand History's curriculum is online at the Ministry of Education website. Um, and one of the things that was clear from that consultation is the differences, uh, is the number of people who believe that there needs to be uh, um, a consistent and central normed, I guess, mm -hmm. view of history to be taught. And actually, history is a very um, varied thing depending on where you are in the country. There's some similarities and there's some real differences and the multiplicity of histories is one of the things that um, the culture and heritage sector will be able to provide with schools, provide that support that's just to what you were saying Tara um, and it was identified in the consultation as an area of, of real um, uncertainty from people who responded. You know, they weren't feeling comfortable about it, like how are we supposed to know, what are, what are we? What is the story that we're supposed to tell without getting ourselves in trouble when we don't know the story itself? But you know, one of the one of the really interesting things that I was talking to a colleague about is during the when the New Zealand wars were on, um, that was very and very much a North Island thing. But what was going on in the rest of the country, in the in the middle of um, the South, was the gold rush at the same time. So you know, you might be working in a space that is um, referencing. The gold rush in Otago, mostly in your content, but that's the same time as the New Zealand War. So let's let's pull that stuff together and bring it, make it come to life for learners, because people in the South were having experiences of what was going on in the North. It was just a different thing. So, and regardless of what our institutions or our spaces are, whether we are museums, galleries, um, aquariums, zoos, science centres, we've all got an aspect of that story that we can tell. So it's just finding you know, how as a community we can work together. As I bring us to a close uh, today, I also want to, to think, you know, we've talked about a lot about teachers and their professional learning. Equally too, it's about us as educators in our spaces, how we can help support, um, support our teachers and our communities, but equally ourselves. So taking advantage of the, the networking and the professional learning programs that will be on offer for the next 15 months is one of the ways that we can do that. You know, we are, the TIP project team that you've met of Monica, Helen and Mel will have lots of opportunities for people to be able to come together and share and collaborate on different projects, but equally continue to build our profession so we go stronger and stronger in a, in a better place to uh, be able to support the requests that we get in and think widely about the work that we're doing. Um, Pam, as we come to a close, I really want to thank you so much for coming in. It's been a hugely rich discussion um, and I think that we've all benefited from the knowledge that you've shared from that very uh, broad overview of our education system right down to how our spaces can help. I mean, I think we could have talked all day about this and I am going to invite you back for a second version actually because I've got a whole lot of questions now from that as I'm sure others will, but we'll give you a few weeks before I uh, place you in front of the camera again. But it, when I introduced Pam, I said how lucky we were that we've got someone of her calibre working in our space with that national system overview. And I, I do think that we've got that. We, we are lucky that we've got that here that can help inform us. 
equally we've got all our committed people on board um, that are working hard in their own communities to do that. But having that national picture, understanding that system level is hugely beneficial for our work going forward. So. Uh, look, thank you so much for, for coming along. Um, and I've got a really nice bit of carrot cake for you uh, following this whole year. So thank you. Because it's all about cake. <laughs> yeah, all about cake. And I'm sorry I can't share that with everyone. <laughs> um, now, just to, as we finish, I'm just going to bring up our next webinar that we've got on. So just bear with me while I uh, bring up my slides to share. Uh, next week, we have um, another of our Papa Learning team coming in. Uh, to talk to us. Um, so next Thursday, the 30th of September at 3.30, we have Jessie Robeson joining us. She's again helping us set the overview of the scene for this piece of work going forward. And she's going to be talking about design thinking and problem-based learning as a structure for programming in our spaces. So Jessie, um, well, she's got a lot of expertise across areas. She'll be coming in and focusing in on design thinking and how that can help us. So that's next week. The following week, we have Laura Jones coming in from Te Papa as well, who will be talking about visual uh, thinking strategies. And uh, but more on that coming up shortly. But join us next week um, for Jesse's session. And I know the links were sent out in the recent newsletter that Mel sent out uh, to you. So um, same same uh, webinar link, I believe, and all that. But yeah, contact Mel if you've got any questions about that. Um, but look, thank you everyone for uh, coming along and being part of this. It's been exciting to see so many of you here for what has been a, an unofficial launch, but one that we here at the Papa and the project team have been very much looking forward to. I'm going to close this with karakia and then we'll have a farewell from the team. So, um, te tawa mai i runga, te tawa mai i raro, te tawa mai i roto, te tawa mai i waho. Kia tō ai. Te mori tu, te mori ora, kiti katoa, homie, huie, tai hiki e. Kia thanks everyone. Kia ora, thank you. Thanks everyone. Um, remember to reach out to me if you've got any questions or any ideas. We're keen to hear from you, that's what we're here for. It's been great um, having everybody come into this webinar, the start of many to come. Um, thank you so much for being part of this today. We look forward to seeing you again um, next week.